May 2nd, 1927. Mr. Fox, dear sir, I am well, trusting these few lines will find you sane. Mr. Fox, if it is not asking too much, I would like to know if you had any luck in getting off the letter, as I am in need of some ready money to pay on a loan that I was forced to get over a year ago. I also need some clothing. So you see, I am in quite a little rut. I will be glad to get every letter. Every little bit helps. Trusting you can help me some. I remain, thankfully, Thomas E. McKellar, 748 Columbus Avenue, Suite 3, Care of Saunders.
And how are you this evening? If they go missing, I know who to come looking for. <laughs> and thank you. Welcome. It's really, really beautiful to see so many faces here tonight. And, you know, we have a little thing for you this evening. Here's what's beautiful for me about this evening. So, sorry, I'm Helga Davis, and <laughs> I am the museum's visiting curator for the performing arts. It means that I get to do stuff like this. <laughs> and one of the things that's so, so lovely about all of this is that it's, it took a great piece of art to inspire some more great art. And in this tradition of Isabella Stewart Gardner, who, who had the, the artists and who surrounded herself with the artists and the, the, the visual artists, the musicians of the day, we're doing the same thing. We're continuing to use the collection as a catalyst to make new work, to commission new work, that's Jules, to commission new works, to have conversations with our larger community, and to reunite one family with its story. And that, that can't be lost here this evening. Whatever you see, whatever you feel about what you see, that's a thing that can't be lost, that we're reuniting one family with its story, through song, through dance, and of course, through the exhibition, which I hope, if you've not seen it yet, that you will have a chance to do so. So, we have lots of stuff happening this evening. Let's move on, shall we? And please help me welcome to the stage a pianist whom I love and who you're about to know and love if you've not met her before. This is Lara Downs, and I'll speak with her after she plays. Thank you again for coming and welcome. <laughs>
This is Lara Downs. This is Lara Downs. So, Lara, that was the music of Florence Price. And we know that Florence Price and Thomas McKellar were in Boston at around, around the same time. Tell me what it is here. Let's, we're going to find a talking place so they can do that there. Tell me what it is about this music from this period that's so important to you. I will, but first can I tell you all that I've never played that music in public before tonight. <laughs> So this music is important because it's important. It's also important because it's just recently discovered after many years of being literally physically lost to us. And I've been bringing it back under my hands. And um, I'm a little emotional. Honestly, this is a first. Yes. Why is this music important? If this music is important, well, wait a minute. Where, where was the music? The music. So Florence Price was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, moved up to Chicago, but first stopped here in Boston to go to New England Conservatory. Uh, she had a tremendous career. She was the first African-American female composer ever to be performed by a major symphony orchestra in this country in 1933, Chicago Symphony. And I'm bringing her piano concerto back to the Chicago Symphony this summer, and there's so many homecomings happening. Um, but, you know, just a leading figure in her time. Chicago at that time, you know, there was a renaissance happening. She was at the heart of it. She wrote and wrote and wrote so much music. She was teaching. She was corresponding and collaborating with all the great thinkers and artists of her time. Her colleague, uh, Margaret Bonds, and I'll play a little bit later, Langston Hughes. It was just this whole network of great minds. And um, after her death, her music was somewhat forgotten. You know, tastes changed and... The world moved on, and the 50s happened, and the 60s happened, and all of that. Um, her music ended up in an abandoned house in Illinois, in boxes, in disarray. About 10 years ago, a young couple bought that house, and instead of tearing it down, they decided to renovate. They found these boxes of raggedy old music stores, and I don't know for what grace of whom, but they took this music down eventually to the University of Arkansas where it sat in archives for many more years. And about two years ago, I was down in Texas doing a residency, um, playing some music, the very little bit of her music that had been published at that point. My host, a musicologist named Michael Cooper, um, got really excited at dinner when I started talking to him about Florence Price and I went on home and got an email from him a few days later saying, guess what, I've got a sabbatical, I'm going down to Arkansas. And uh, he did, and he started sending me little photos of these, I mean, really just, you know, water damaged, torn, crumpled, these scores. Um, and he started editing them, and I started learning them. And um, then along the way, Shermer, the big <laughs> publishing house, acquired the catalog. So now all of this music is coming out in editions. I'm putting out recordings, and I'm playing the music for rooms full of people like you, and it's just an incredible joy. Yeah. But you can play any kind of piano music. So what is it about music from this period and these women and this relationship of African-American people to the classical world that is important to you? That's such a long answer. Um, so many things. I mean, it's just a fascinating music uh, moment musically because it's a moment you know, if you look at the shifts that are happening in the country at the time, it's, it's the great migration and the, the cities are reshaping themselves and the citizenry is shaping, reshaping itself. And people like Florence Price are reaching back into their own traditions, into the African-American tradition, into the African-American church and taking these melodies and combining them with a training, a sensibility that, they, that she has acquired at great cost at the New England Conservatory. You know, so there are these these two traditions coming together, and that's so symbolic if we look at that, that time and, and you know where we were as a country. Um, and then I think I feel a lot of kinship because places where people come together, um, you know, sort of the reason that I'm here at all. 
um, uh, women. I'm a big fan of whipping composers. There's so many things just bundled up in this music that make it really important for me. And I think for a, a lot of listeners, I did. Um, I spoke with the newspaper here a couple weeks ago, and I said, you know, there are shifts that happen at the highest levels in, in programming. The great institutions start to program women, music by women, music by writers of color, and that's an incredibly important change, but so is this change for this music to find its way into the hands of pianists and piano students around this country and around the world, and then all of a sudden the canon changes. You know, and you say, I can play anything, and I can, but anything and everything has really meant only one thing for such a long time. So, opening the doors. Here we go. Thank you so much. This is Lara Downs. You know what? I'm not even going to tell you. I'm going to sit down. Here we go. June 13th, 1927, Boston, Massachusetts. Mr. Fox, dear sir, I received the letter bearing the check for $10. These are just a few lines of thanks for saying. It helped me much. I trust you will have some good luck with the letter in the near future, and I as well. Trusting these few lines will find you enjoying good health. Sincerely, Thomas E. McKellar, 748 Columbus Avenue, Suite 3, care of Saunders.
please help me welcome the choreographer of that work, Levi Marsman. Hi, Levi. Come here. <laughs> Tell us about that. Uh, so I was just so inspired by the idea of um, Thomas McCullough coming to Boston at that time, like choosing Boston of all places. And um, what we saw was, you know, what that's, that city life might look like to him. The music has so much repetition, and I thought, how what is that in Boston? That is culture, that is going to parties, that is seeing the same people over and over, waving at the same people. Uh, and the section is called Colored, and what it must feel like, or what it must have felt like to be colored in Boston. And uh, I hope that when he was here, you know, meeting different people like Isabella Gardner and uh, John Singer Sargent, that he was also inspired by the color around him and that he didn't take for granted that he was in a new place and wanted to be a part of the culture. Um, so in the beginning, it seems like kind of awkward movement and then towards the end, there's more of a flow that happens because he's becoming more um, accustomed to what is around him. And then he finally sees, has his first encounter with John Singer Sargent, someone that knows the culture, that everyone, you know, the darling of Boston, that everyone is interested in. And it only makes his influence in, uh, in Boston even more great. Tell us about the second piece, which we're going to see now. Uh, so this will be a look into Sargent's studio. Um, what it must have looked like for uh, McKellar to come in on an artist working, and what their interactions must have been like working together, just the two of them on so many great projects. What how intimate, how um, special those moments were for the two of them, um, because they had to be for him to um, create so many beautiful works off of one black man and changing his, you know, using his body but changing his face for these larger works is, you know, a story that um, I don't think we are um, used to hearing. You know, we're used to, you know, this is who it was and this is what it came out to, but. Really, this is who it was, and we turned it. He turned it into something else, and w I was just wondering, like, what would those moments be like when they were together? Um, when Sergeant looked at McKellar naked for different, you know, art, and uh, how special that was for him. This is Levi Marsman. <laughs> Thank you. We'll be right back. Sorry.
to have a moment just to chat with the, uh, with the curator of this exhibition. Where's Nat Silver sitting right next to me? Come here, Nat. Oh no, we have to give Nat a hand. Sorry about that. <laughs> because he could have found those drawings and put them back <laughs> where they were, right? And then we wouldn't all be here right now. So what was it about them that intrigued you so much that you, you had to, you pulled them out, you saw them, and then? So many things. Um, I looked at the ceiling of the Museum of Fine Arts that these were studies for, and I looked at the paper, and the man on the paper was not in the ceiling. All of the figures in the ceiling were white, the man on the paper was black. And I thought, who is this man? Um, I want to find out more about him. And he appeared in so many of the drawings. I thought if he's behind all of those figures, this work must have gone on for years, which it did. And this relationship must have been an extensive one and an intensive one. Um, and it, it must have meant much to both him as well as the painter. Um, and I wanted to know ab about this story. And I thought it was important that everyone should know, because if we celebrate the painter who created these paintings, why aren't we celebrating the model who posed for these works? I think as Steve Locke so beautifully talks about in the film, if maybe some of you have seen the film related to this exhibition, there's nothing easy about modeling, first of all, and second of all, the artist can't do what he or she does without the model. So Thomas McKellar unlocked a potential, a creative potential in John Singer Sargent that had not previously been there. It was not until he met Thomas McKellar that he started working on these studies for the Museum of Fine Arts murals. So this was a, a, th this was a, a two-way relationship. And why weren't we celebrating this unsung hero? Do you think that McKellar and Gardner knew one another? We know from the little bit of evidence that survives that at the very least, they came across each other once. Um, Gardner had gone to John Singer Sargent's studio one weekend to listen to um, Spanish music records. They both love flamenco music. And she had brought her records with her um, and she was at that time, she had had a stroke, and so she couldn't get up the stairs. And Thomas McKellar carried her up the stairs. So we know at the very least they met on that occasion. But because Sargent had been in Boston for such a long period of time, on and off over the course of these eight years, and Gardner spent so much time with him, she and Thomas McKellar must have met on many occasions because she was one of the people who was invited into the studio, into this semi private place uh, where he was posing. Nat, thank you so much for bringing this exhibition to life, to inspiring, for inspiring all of us to be here this evening. Thank you so, 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 so much. I wanted you to wait and see if you would carry me back to my <laughs> seat. Yeah. Never mind. <laughs> Please help me welcome a very, very special human. His name is Devon Times. I'm going to speak with him after.
Devon. Hello. <laughs> what was that? What was that? Um, that was a song, um, Song to the Dark Virgin of Florence Price, set on a Langston Hughes uh, text. And why? Why that? Uh, why? That's a song I've known for quite a while. I sang it at my grad school audition, scared out of my mind. And uh, now I kind of visit it in a different way. Um, it's a complicated relationship that Langston is making with whomever uh, the subject is, and I think it can be kind of reflexive in this context. Um, there's uh, Sergeant at McKellar, perhaps saying, I want to, you know, show your body, be so close to it, and really understand and portray it, um, maybe to the point of annihilation, which there is some aspect of. And then there's also um, perhaps McKellar to Sargent, not understanding his confusing relationship and dynamic. So maybe having some of the same feelings of connection, but complication. You and I have spoken a bit over the last couple of days since you've been here about how emotional this, this exhibition is for us. I'd like to hear a little bit from you. Tell us what you wrote on the, on the wall uh, in the exhibition and talk a little bit about that. Yeah, um, I basically wrote, um, I am an opera singer and my body is taken from me on every stage. And what I mean by that, um, it, it can mean a lot of different things. Um, in a way, you're offering yourself up to people, to connect to, to hopefully share something with them. And then sometimes there's context in such place upon you that um, feel a bit foreign to your own idea of yourself. Uh, one example, we, we talked about this, um, I was working on a project with a composer and everything was supposed to deal with something going on in the world that was a little dark or wrong. And so I asked him to write about um, the prison industrial complex. And he thought about it and got back to me and said, um, I don't really want to use my work on my platform to be political. And um, I sat up straight in bed and I thought, oh my gosh, maybe I have to fire him. Because, <laughs> because um, you know, I told him that whenever I walk on stage in Alice Tully Hall to sing Mozart's Requiem, um, I'm first seen as a tall black man and I'm working in that context, in reality, whether I choose to acknowledge it or not or work in concert with it or against it. Um, sometimes it's interesting to blow what you think expectations are by delivering things that are outside of the context of what ex what's expected. So, yeah, something is taken or something is engaged. Sometimes it's offered, sometimes it's not. What is important and special to you about being here for this opening and working in the context with these artists. Yes, um, it's an absolutely incredible exhibition and so wonderful that you've allowed this space to be here to explore this story, which otherwise hasn't been explored. You introduced Thomas McKellar to me and it's been so wonderful in the context of basically a growing family, you know, adding people to, you know, the group of people you can have a conversation with about some of these more personal things. Um, just thankful. Thank you so much. We'll see you later in the show. I was going to say something, but I think I'm just going to sit down.
you know what kind of church y'all grew up in? I grew up in the loud church where you just yell it out. Just tell me before you go, you have a new CD, you have CDs out now. We have some also in the gift shop here, just in case you need to know that. Uh, tell us the name and all that. So there are a bunch of those in the gift shop. Please buy them, enjoy them. There's a range of things. Um, the most recent, I guess, that's there is a, a project I did to celebrate the 200th birthday of Clara Schumann a couple of months ago, um, and then a lot of other things. And then everything I played tonight, these two pieces, these two pieces by Margaret Bonds, um, the first of which is also a new discovery, um, will come out on an album that's coming on April 3rd that's all music inspired by, related to spirituals and freedom songs and making the world a better place. Thank you. <laughs> It's huge, this thing. But you know what? Miss D, come over here. Don't take all day. Come. <laughs> so this is D McKellar. Miss D, it has been such an adventure. You have to wait until I put the microphone by your mouth. I can't do that. Hurry up. And this is how we love one another. <laughs> it's been quite an adventure pulling all of this together. And I'm wondering if you could just tell us a little bit how it feels to feel all of this energy, all of these lives, all of this part of your story coming together. It's been like something that you can't imagine until I guess you experience it yourself. Uh, I was 70 years old when all of this came about, about my great uncle. We knew some things about him, but not a whole lot about his life here in Boston. And just knowing and answering some questions that maybe I had thought about or something, it's just been a book or a chapter that's closed and completed for me. And of course, I have asked in uh, Wilmington, North Carolina, uh, uh, but people who I thought might know, or his family might have known my uncle, but they're all deceased now, uh, too, so I couldn't really find out anything from anybody else there about him. But the people who know the McKellar family, and that's just about everybody in Wilmington, uh, they're just so happy for me. And they said, you know, that's, it's, it's about time that somebody gets some recognition like this. And I have to tell you, when the book came out and I opened the book and shared it with some of my neighbors, it was like the library. Did you check that book out? Well, it's supposed to be back at 2 o'clock today because <laughs> my neighbor back here wants to look at it. And she's supposed to have it from 2 to 6. So then you got to take it to this one over here. <laughs> But they have already planned, uh, well, you need to uh, have an uh, opening at your house, uh, an unveiling of, of everything that you have learned about him. And I'm saying, my house is not the museum. This is not what we do. But they have planned some things for me, so. But in a way, it is what we do, right, Misty? That, that then you, you invite people into your home who can also help you hold this story and tell others so that it, it isn't just this one night and that the story doesn't just end or be end with you. No, I have a friend who is 98 years young and her only regret is she could not come with me. She has said so many times, 
if I could just knock 10 years off, I'd be right there with you. <laughs> this is Dee McKellar. Thank you, Ms. Dee. July 29th, 1948, Mr. David McKibben. Dear Sir, I received your letter seeking some information as to my affiliation with Mr. John Sargent's works. Well, I was engaged by him while he was during the painting for the Boston Public Library. Of course, most of my work was done at his Columbus Avenue studio. During my services, I believe I became his main model while he was here in this country. A lot of the murals he did here went to England. He did a painting of a soldier mural, I believe, for Harvard University. This was in commemoration of the dead soldiers of World War I. Then his next big task was his decoration of the staircase at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, Atlas with the world on his shoulders. This was my body, except my head. As I said before, many of his paintings was did here and was carried to England. And a lot of these I know very little about, except I posed for most of them. You ask about whether he was indebted to me at the time of his death. I was still engaged and was contacted by Mr. Fox for my services for him. He was at this time getting ready to sail for this country from England when death occurred, so Mr. Fox notified me. Also, had a talk with me and said that he was writing a letter to his sister in Chelsea, England, concerning me. I believe it was a matter of gratuity, but not of death. If my letter interests you, and if any more information I can give you, I will be glad to. Sincerely, Thomas E. McKellar, 107 Townsend Street, Roxbury, Massachusetts.
Uh-huh, come here. This is our composer, Bongani Dodana Breen. How are you? I'm actually quite emotional at all this, the sense of history coming together and this wonderful um, relationship between Sargent and Michaela um, coming together and also getting to hear and experience uh, Michaela's entire life, actually. It's, it's quite moving to see somebody being resurrected and acknowledged and given their, their due. Yeah. So the text that you're hearing is actually in the exhibition. These are letters written by Thomas McKellar. And Bongani set those letters for us to this beautiful music. What did you, when you first read them, what were you what were you thinking? Well, I mean, I was I think I was given three letters. One was for context, and the first one was the, the asking for for money, and I that really resonated with me um, in terms of the relationship that these two had. You know, they met uh, when he was a, a, um, a bell, um, elevator uh, operator at the Hotel Van Damme here. And of course, a singer sergeant was famous on both sides of the Atlantic. How the two of them, one being at the apex of, of Boston society and the other one being a blue collar sort of like worker and how <coughs> across sort of like culture and that economic divide that they actually happen to have a relationship that um, you know, fostered all this creativity um, that uh, is in the exhibition. Um, the <coughs> letter that, um, that was uh, sung now, um, how I approached that was this element of excitement that you have when, when a check finally comes and you've got this <laughs> cha 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 cha. <laughs> so I um, was trying to capture maybe some of uh, his emotion um, wh while he was uh, writing those, those words. 
And the second piece um, is a bit more, uh, I think it speaks to what Nate was talking about in terms of the intimacy of, of this relationship between the two of them. Um, all I can do as a composer, because the words are already there, was just try to add some color and um, portray a little bit of this tenderness. And also, it's the last of the letters, I think, that we have. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes um, uh, more reflexive um, of not only um, uh, him reflecting on Sargent, but also the relationship, the partnership, and the, the life and the intimacy that they shared creating art. Um, and so, yeah, there's a bit of nostalgia in that for me, and uh, you'll hear it in the music. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Let's hear it now. of a soldier mural, I believe, for Harvard University. This was in commemoration of the dead soldier of World War One. His next big task was the decoration of the staircase in the Boston Museum of Fine i 
time of his death I was still engaged and was contracted by Mr. Fox for my services to him. He at the time was getting ready to sail for this country from England when Come, Bongani, you have to come. Take one more bow. Yeah, you do. Bongani Dodana Breen. of everything, but hasn't it been a great evening? I cannot tell you enough how happy, really, really happy I am to see all of you here. We have lots of other programming coming up uh, this year, and I was invited back by the gardener, so I'm planning Many, many, many wonderful treats and other shoes for you. <laughs> so you'll have to come back. <laughs> That's a nice thing. Be sure to see the exhibition. If how late can people still see it tonight or they have to come back now? Ish. So that's not really. You'll have to come back and see it. But please really do come back and see it. And do we have any of our uh, community activist folks in the house tonight? No? I can't, I can't see. Theo, you're here? Make your way down the stairs. Quick, quick, quick. There we go. Hi, Theo. Hello. Tell everybody what you did for this exhibition, who you are a little bit, and, and how you participated in the exhibition. 
Well, my name is Theo Tyson. I'm the Polythayer Star Fellow in American Art and Culture at the Boston Athenaeum, which is where some of those communications about Thomas McKellar and John Singer Sargent came from. I am out of breath. <laughs> it's okay, come, so, come this way, come this way. Um, what happened is the amazing team here at the Gardner reached out to the community and asked different people for perspectives on how we could interpret the work, historically, contemporarily, and I had the privilege and pleasure of writing about erasure. Um, when we start talking about someone's history, someone's memory, things that aren't seen, marking the unmarked, so the label in the exhibition upstairs on erasure, I wrote, and then there's another piece that I wrote in response to a particular drawing, so. How did you feel when you first saw the drawings? Struck by their beauty, just this year, it's John Singer Sargent, so there's a certain level of talent and artistry that can't go unnoticed. Um, there was a level of intimacy that I wasn't ex expecting, and when you look at scholarship surrounding nudes and male nudes, especially with John Singer Sargent, you don't talk about that. You only talk about the artistry, and this was a chance to do a deeper dive. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you did that. I'm so glad you ran down the stairs to stand here <laughs> next to me. We are going to see our final dance for the evening. I'm going to say good night to you now so that you all can run out when you need to. And I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. for showing your love and support this evening. Everybody's gonna take a bow at the end so you can clap them off. And I'll see you again. Thank you so much.